reach into your uh, bulletin and get out this faith promise card. Uh, just to remind you again, uh, the idea of faith promise isn't magic. It is to exercise their faith. We believe that uh, God shouldn't have to bless us tenfold for us to tithe. And then the church takes a tithe of that. So basically 1% will end up going to missions. <coughs> uh, that missions are such a high priority to God that there are times when he wants to supply 100% for the needs of the world. And so uh, in faith, we uh, pray for God to put a number on our heart. You're going to fill that out here. Uh, after you fill it out, you're going to tear this in half. The part with your name, phone number, and email, that you put in the basket here. John, don't uh, lift the basket by the handle because it's kind of broken. Uh, okay. And Pastor John will be holding that basket at the end of the service. And the, the part that says Faith Promise Card, my 12-month pledge, that's for you to take home. And put that on your mirror uh, where you shave every morning or on your um, uh, refrigerator door where you get your food every day. And that's a reminder for you to be praying that God would supply those funds that 100% would go to missions. And your agreement is when that unexpected uh, money comes in, um, God, uh, I'm going to believe that you've provided that to support global missions. So uh, we'll be receiving those at the end of the service. Now, um, many of you who have not been at KCC for 40 plus years uh, may not know the story of our history. But back in 1983 and 1984, things were not very good at this church. We had a pastor who was uh, not very biblical and was making some decisions that brought uh, tremendous embarrassment upon this congregation in our community, and um, so much so that some of the great saints of our church who were on the board called the district superintendent, and a uh, famous story, actually took the church key off the key ring, set it on the table, and said, you either give us a pastor who preaches the Bible, or there's the key. And I, I heard that that former pastor, his last Sunday, there were 35 people in the sanctuary to hear him. That's how bad it was. God heard the prayers of his people. And he sent uh, a spiritual giant to be the pastor of this church. And it affected a turnaround in the history of the church. And I'm at, I was actually the third pastor in the history of that turnaround, and Ricky is the fourth. Uh, but it all started with Pastor John Christie and Leanna and their family coming from uh, Fall River Mills, mm -hmm. kind of like Baja, Oregon, uh, <laughs> way, way up north. And uh, they came here, and John preached the gospel, and he established, uh, reestablished a base, base of devotion to Christ and wholehearted discipleship. And then God called them to the mission field in Ghana, where they did theological education by extension. And so th he also planted a deep seed of uh, missions in the heartbeat of our church, which, of course, our missions conference this week continues uh, to keep hot. So it is just a tremendous blessing to have John and Leanna with us uh, this week. And John, come on up and share the word with us. And again, he'll be uh, holding the faith promise basket at the end as we sing the last hymn, and that uh, excuses me from weeping all over the carpet. So, John, great to have you here, brother. All right, thanks. Good to be here. It's been a long time, but it's so good to be with you again. Oh, my goodness. Uh, that first week in July, 1984, we're driving through Selma on our way here to meet the moving van at 8.30 in the morning. It's a little bit after 8 o'clock. In Selma, there's a time and temperature that was flashing. It was already like 86 degrees or some ridiculous thing. And we were in the midst of, I think, three weeks of 100 degree plus weather. And Leanna and I looked at each other and we're not in Kansas anymore, you know. <laughs> this is a brave new world for us. And then that first week I was here, two local residents smashed into my car. And it turns out that they were both insured by members of our congregation. 
So that was kind of cool. That first Sunday I got up and I said, I think a lot of the residents here took a crash course in driving. <laughs> so, man, those were the days. One of the, oh, we made a lot of mistakes, of course. But one of the things we did was start Faith Promise Missions. And I can't tell you how deeply touched and pleased, gratified, joyful I am to see that it's not merely continuing, but going beyond all that we ever thought it could be. Our text for today, you are very familiar with. It is your theme verses for your week of missions. Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15. Hear now God's word. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Lord, I pray that we would have beautiful feet that this congregation would be messengers of the good news of the grace of Jesus. And Lord, we do pray over um, our world and what's happening. And Lord, when we hear of wars and rumors of wars and pandemics and earthquakes, we are comforted because Lord, it is just how you said it would be. And so, Lord, give us the grace to shine with your light in the darkness of this world, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So you know the context of the book of Romans where this passage is written is this. The Apostle Paul is writing about his countrymen, his fellow Israelites, many of whom who have not turned to the Lord, who have not embraced the faith. But what he says here extends to everyone. He says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone in the Jewish nation? Yes. Everyone in all the Gentile nations? Yes. This is actually a quote from Joel chapter 2, verse 32. And here we have one of the many, many, many passages in the Old Testament that originally referred to the Lord God Almighty, but now in the New Testament are used in reference to the Lord Jesus without qualification. And so the Lord Jesus is worthy of our allegiance. In the, on the mission field, we always used to say, where he sends, we will follow. What he feeds, we will swallow. And um, he is Lord of all. He is Lord of all. He is worthy of our allegiance. And then it says, and there's a flow here, no one can call upon the Lord unless they believe first. It takes faith. And no one can believe unless they hear. And when it says, this is fascinating, and how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? It's talking about hearing Jesus. And this is remarkable that in God's plan, he wants people to hear the voice of Jesus through the likes of of you and me. It's a high and holy calling. And then it says, and how can they hear without someone preaching to them? I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, that's not me. I'm not a preacher. I haven't been to seminary. I haven't been trained. That's not me. I'm glad we hire preachers like Ricky, Pastor Ricky, and Pastor Ed, and you know, we hire people to do the. Not so fast. Hold up just a moment. Here's something very fascinating the word in the original language that's translated preach and preaching in this passage. Where it says, and how can anyone preach unless they are sent, is keruso in the Greek language. And that word is used to describe the naked, 
crazy, homeless lunatic who lived among the tombs in the story in Mark chapter 5. You might remember this story where the Lord Jesus drives out a legion of demons from this guy. He was cutting himself with stones. He was a crazy man. And then the Lord touches him. He's healed. And he wants to follow Jesus. Now listen to what it says. Mark 5, verse 19. Jesus did not let him. It's kind of odd that the Lord, there's someone who wants to follow him. He goes, no, 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 no. I've got something else for you. The Lord has something for each of us. Jesus did not let him, he, but said, go to your home, to your own people, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Now, this is the first time in this gospel where this word tell occurs in this passage. And this one is not keruso, but it's uh, apangelo, which simply means to tell or to announce as a messenger. Its root word is angelo, which is our word angel. You know, the word angel just means messenger. The Lord says, I'm authorizing you to go and be a messenger and just tell people in your home what the Lord has done for you. And then we have verse 20. So the man went away and began to tell. It's there. To tell in the Decapolis, that's the region, it means the ten cities, how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Here the word translated tell is keruso, the same word that is translated preach and preaching in our passage, in our theme verses. And that means that the Lord authorized a homeless lunatic who cut himself to go and be a preacher, to tell people in his home what the Lord has done for us. And so he has authorized all of us. If he can authorize that crazy man to go and do this, we are able to do it. We are authorized to go. We are authorized to go. Have you been touched by the goodness of God, by the grace of Jesus in any way? Then you are authorized to go and share what the Lord has done for you. God wants us to be a church on mission, but it takes all of us, every one of us, not just the preachers, not just the church leaders, it takes, we are all authorized. And then we come to verse 15, which is such an encouragement. By the way, before we get to verse 15, let's go back because it says, no one will hear preaching, no one will hear anyone tell about the good news of Jesus unless they are sent. So that means to complete the flow, people have to be sent. So this is a beautiful teaching. Kingsburg Community Church, this place right here, this is a sending place. Now, it's a gathering place, yes. We gather together. We praise the name of the Lord with grateful hearts. The Lord has done so much for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're hurting. It's a rough world out there. We lick each other's wounds. We pray for each other. We encourage each other every day, as long as it's called today. This is a wonderful place. We're a family. We gather. We love each other. We get hugs here. But then, every Sunday, we're sent back out. This is a sending place. Now, some of you will be sent to the ends of the earth. Some will be sent... Yeah, across the country maybe. Some maybe across the state to London, New London. Some will be sent across town. Some of you will be sent across your street to invite your neighbors to come and hear the word of hope, to share what the Lord has done. 
Some of you are authorized and sent to go across your living room to members of your own family and share what the Lord has done for you. I'm wondering if even this day, here's my prayer, thinking about coming here, that maybe the Lord will touch someone in this congregation during this faith promise season to accept a call to be career or long-term missionaries and to go wherever the Lord may lead. That's my hope and that's my prayer. It's a great joy for this congregation. So I have to thank you because you were my sending church. You sent my family and I to Ghana and you supported us with your prayers, with your financial gifts. And, you know, once, I don't know who did this, somebody, your missions committee, sent a huge box that, were, that was filled with little teeny tiny boxes of sun-made raisins. <laughs> Look at this. Look what came in the mail. And that Sunday, we were going to preach at a village out in the outskirts, a remote village. And I said, let's take these raisins out to the village. And so they had no church in this village. They met under trees, you know, like so many. And I have a translator, and we're preaching, and I said, you know, we have a gift for you. And oh, people are happy to get a gift. And our kids distributed all these little boxes. Most of those people had never seen a raisin before. And they opened it up and looked at it. What do we do with this thing? You know what? Well, we're supposed to eat it. And in Ghana, they don't really smell things before they eat. Um, so I saw one man, he tore a raisin in half. And he looked at it and then he touched it to his tongue, just like that. Ah. And then they ate it and they liked them. And so a little contingent came to me, you know, a little later said, we want to know, if we put these in the ground, will they grow more for us? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, didn't work that way. And then not only did you send and support me, you were ascending church for my daughter, Malia and her husband, Angel Hernandez, who served for nine and a half years in Paraguay. So this congregation has been supporting my family in our call to mission for 15 and a half years. Thank you. This is a sending place. Who's going to be next? It might be someone here. So we come to verse 15, the verse I want to focus on. What an encouragement. As it is written... How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. As it is written where? In the book of Isaiah. The gospel of Isaiah. Chapter 52, verse 7. I'm going to read the whole passage for you. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Who proclaim peace. Who bring good tidings. Who proclaim salvation. Who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Let's note a couple things about this passage. First, in the context of Isaiah's time, these are messengers who are coming to announce the good news, good tidings, that the exile of God's people in Babylon, where they were held in captivity for 70 years, is over. The slaves are set free. This is like, well, in American history, I guess the only thing would be the Civil War is over. 
And when the news reached people's ears, there's dancing in the streets. People are singing. The slaves are set free. We've got a new future. I don't know if there's anything in... This is a once in a generation or two or three opportunity. The messenger has beautiful feet who comes with this news because he is bringing such a beautiful message. It's like music to our ears. Then secondly, note how far the good news will travel. In the sight of all the nations and all the ends of the earth, we'll see the salvation of our God. How far does it reach? To the ends of the earth. To the very ends of the earth. And we can do our part. So how are we doing? Well, last week, I listened to your, the message. Pastor Ed uh, gave you some updated information about unreached peoples. I want to look at a different, um, slightly different track. So here's the status of global Christianity. I get this from uh, the Center for World Mission at my seminary's website. Uh, So C represents the number of professing Christians in the world. So in 1900, 35% of the world. Now it's 32%, and it's projected in 2015 to be 34%. Why is it projected to go up? Because, thank you, Lord, Christianity is growing in the global south. Not in North America. No, I'm so sorry. Not in Europe. No, no, no. But in the global south. B represents those who have Bibles in their own language, those who have a chance to hear the good news, they have a church in their community, they know Christians, but they have not accepted the offer of God's grace and forgiveness of sins. They say, no thanks. Notice, from 1900, in 122 years, that percentage has gone from 11%, it's gone up to 40% who have now rejected the good news. Why is that? Two primary reasons. One is increasing secularization. I'm going to come back to that in just a sec. And the second is the rise of Islam. But increase in secularization. There's a Pew Research Center just put out a study last month. In 2007, there were 78% of Americans who professed to follow Jesus, who said, I am a Christian. Now, we know that not all those who profess have really been born again, but at least 78% said yes. Now, that has dropped down to 63% today. In another 15 years, we're going to be less than half if that trend continues. And then those who self-identify as atheists or agnostics or no religion has risen from 16% in 2007 up to 29% today. That means that one out of every three people in America says, No, I've heard the good news. It's it's not for me. Not for me. And then the A category. Oh, by the way, well, let's just go on to the A category. Those are people who are unreached, who do not have the Bible in their own language, who have no churches in their community. These are people who have never, ever, ever, ever heard the name of Jesus. 54% in 1900, and then the missionary explosion. And look how well the Church of Jesus did from 1900 to today. Dropped, whittled it down to 28%. But the projection is it will stay at 28% by 2050. Why? Well, because of extreme population increases in developing nations and in nations that haven't heard the name of Jesus. And so the call to be involved in missions is as great as it's ever been. And it's the call that is before us this morning. Last week, Pastor Ed gave us three alternatives. You can go, you can send, or you can disobey. 
I'm assuming if you were here last week and you heard that and you decided to disobey, you wouldn't be back here this Sunday. (laughs) So let's eliminate the disobey part, all right? Let's do that. Let's decide as a church family, we're going to do our part. How can we do our part? I'm giving you three ways. Number one is to go. This is how you can have beautiful feet. First, you can go. Like I said, some of you will be called to go across the country, across the world, across the seas, some across your own home. But we're all called to go. Every one of us. We're all to go somewhere. We're not meant, God didn't make us, to sit at home and watch TV all the time. Or sit at home on our devices all the time. He made us to go. We need to be active. Get out there. Go. Second thing you can do is you can let go. What happens if one of your children, your son or your daughter, or one of your grandchildren says, the Lord has called me to go overseas to Eastern Europe? And you say, wait a minute. I don't want you to go. I don't want you to go where there's trouble and conflict or, or to Africa. I don't want you to go where there's malaria and there's all kinds of disease. I don't want you to go. I mean, that's understandable. You love your kids, your grandchildren. But it's also very selfish. You have to let them go. Do what my parents did. I was here in Kingsburg when we got the call to go to Africa. So I called my mom to tell my folks. Mom, you know, we've had an interest in missions, and we've accepted a call to go to Ghana, West Africa. Now, my mom always said, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything. And her silence can be deafening. (laughs) And it's like, Mom, Mom, are you there? Hello, hello. You know, finally, and if you're a mom... Well, let's put it this way. If you, ha- you, have, you all have moms. You know the icy tone of voice moms can have. Oh, it's bone chilling, I tell you. My mom says, well, you and Leanna can do whatever you want. But you're not sending my only three grandchildren anywhere. Well, okay, Mom, we're going to have to talk about this a little more. Do you know that she organized an intervention? (laughs) Yeah, other family members to intervene to keep us from going? But I'll say this. Once they saw that our decision had been made and there was no turning to the left or to the right, they became top supporters My mom and dad even went to churches to share our mission and raise funds for us. They supported us so much. They had to learn to let go. When I came to Crosswalk Community Church and the Lord blessed us with a magnificent mission program in a little over 20 years, we raised just under $2 $2 million for missions, supported so many missionaries, and our prayer was always that the Lord would send from our congregation missionaries. So we were at our church camp, and we had a mission speaker from Paraguay come, and he gave a, an altar call. Those who want to come, those who feel the Lord touching you to, to be a missionary, to, to go overseas, to go wherever he'll send you, come on up. And we're praying, oh Lord, someone from our church, yes, And then I see my own daughter get up and my own son and carrying a grandbaby. And and that proved a couple things. Number one, God is just. (laughs) And we had to learn to let go. We had to learn to let go. You can go. You can let go. Or thirdly, and this is what Faith Promise Missions is all about, you can help go. You can help others go. 
If you can't go yourself due to health reasons or you don't have the call or you're called to go across the room or across the state or across town, help others go so that the missionary task will be completed. Here's a lesson. Our joy is to obey, to plant seeds in the lives of others, and then trust God to, call, to cause the growth. I want to wrap it up by sharing three ways we can help go, and it involves trust, faith, and well, I'll get to the third one. Well, it's sacrificial love, but let's go. First, trust. Here's a verse. The Apostle Paul writes, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. Here's what God has called us to do, to plant seeds. Just by sharing a word of encouragement, by sharing what Jesus has done in your life, by giving. When we give to Faith Promise Missions, it's seed planting. And we may not live to even see the harvest, but we trust that God's promises will be fulfilled and that the harvest will be plentiful. And I'm here to say that if the Lord lets you live long enough, sometimes you can see the results of seeds that you planted. So a few years ago, we went back to Ghana. Again, this was, we've gone back a few times. This is the most recent time. And now this is 20, what, three or four years since we've lived there. Like 24 years later, we go back, and I'm preaching at, at my home church, a church that we helped start. It had just started a few months before we got there. And it's a great church. If you're ever in Accra, go to Asbury Dunwell Church. It's a great church. And so um, I'm preaching that day, and, and they had someone like Brian who got up and gave the notices. Now, now it's, we call them announcements, but because... They're British people, you know, British colony. They say they're reading the notices. And let's get the picture of the lady who was reading the notices. This absolutely beautiful Ghanaian woman. And after she reads the notices, she says, and I just want everyone in the congregation to know that I'm a part of this church family because of Reverend and Mrs. Christie. And I turned to Leanne and I said, who is that woman? She said, I don't know. I thought you knew. I said, I've never seen her. I don't know who this is. So I preach, and afterward, we talk with her. And I'll tell you who it is. It's Cecilia. By the way, she's a lawyer now. She's a lawyer serving the Lord with gladness. And so when we first got to Ghana, we're, we're, we're in this home and across the street, all the houses there, they have the big house where the landowner lives. And then there's other little houses where servants live. And so this was a family of servants from way up north. They moved down there, and they heard that I had moved into town, that I was a missionary. And the father sent one of the kids over and said, my father wants you to come and share why you're here. And so I went and they had, had chairs all set up, and they had a big family, and the family's all there. And I just, I didn't preach. I mean, I just told them about Jesus. I said, what the Lord has done. And he said, wonderful. And the father said, my family and I want to follow Jesus. I mean, on the spot. So I said a prayer over them, and I've got a picture. See that picture? That's the family. Look at all them. Cecilia is this lady. See that little girl? Look at her. Now, look at that face, and then go to the next slide, and there she is. A lawyer serving the Lord with gladness. Do you know what we did with those kids? I had a big pickup truck, and we put benches in the back, cover on it. We piled this family, plus all the neighborhood kids who wanted to go, and we took them to church every Sunday and discipled them. And so the Sunday after I preached at this church, the Asbury Dunwell, I preached at the Ridge Church, which is another great church in Accra. And these two guys come up to me. And they said, Pastor, good to see you. And I said, who is this? You know, I said, please help me remember. 
And they were two other little kids that piled in the back of our truck and went, I mean, how simple is that? All we did was help kids get to Sunday school, help kids get to church, help kids get in a children's program, and it's bearing fruit. You can do that. That's what your faith promises. We're planting seeds, and we trust that God will cause the growth. Here's our next lesson. God doesn't call everyone to be a missionary in the sense of going to the ends of the earth. He calls us all to go. It's just a matter of how far we go, right? But he doesn't call everyone to be a missionary, but God does call everyone to be sure the missionary task is accomplished. And to do that, it takes faith. Matthew 9, verse 29, the Lord has healed the blind. And then he says, it says this, he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, will it be done to you? That's kind of a scary verse, isn't it? What if your life was based on your faith? According to your faith, let it be done to you. There was a woman in our church, she had the gift of faith. She was a tremendous woman. She preached at our church. She's a Ghanaian woman who was married to a Swiss man. And um, she did not believe in the health and wealth gospel. She was not all about uh, name it and claim it, claim it, blab it and grab it. You know, th that wasn't her thing. <laughs> but she inched up to that line because she lived by faith in all circumstances. So on our way home for you know, a break, furlough, we, um, we stopped in Switzerland, and they went there ahead of us because her husband had a house there, and they're going to take us around Switzerland. No, that's not Switzerland. But that's all right. You can, yeah, keep it there. Um, and so, yeah, so we're, we're going, and so she says, you know, why don't we get a van? We'll rent a van so we can all be in the same. I said, that's a great, let's do that, yeah. So uh, her husband, uh, Court, the next day, got up, calls the rental car. And uh, they said, we don't have any vans. Our vans are all out. They're not due back for another week. He said, all right, I'll take a car. And I said, you know what? It'll be fine with two cars. We'll drive together. We'll pull off. We'll change. It'll be fine. Yeah, it'll be fine. So a little while later, so long, we're going to the rental car company. And Barbara, the woman of faith, says, oh, you're going to get the van. And her husband says, well, no, you know, they don't have any vans. So we're just going to get another car. She says, oh, no, you're not. That's not what we decided. And she turned to me and said, pastor, did you pray about this? I hate to be put on the spot like that. <laughs> and I said, well, I was going to say something about being in an attitude of prayer, but then I, <laughs> I said, no, I haven't prayed about it. Then let's pray. She gets us in a circle, prays in the name of Jesus. Then she says, now go and don't come home without a van. <laughs> so her husband and I were in the car on the way to the rental place, and we don't say a word. Stoned, cold silence for like 15 minutes. And then finally, I hear a big sigh. And he says, well, I'll say this. My wife is a woman of faith. I said, oh, yes. And then he said, but we'll do fine with two cars. I said, yeah, it'll be fine, two cars. <laughs> so we get to the rental place. And Mr. Murky, yes. And oh, here's your car. Yes, OK, here's the keys. Where is it? Stall 11 down, way down there. So we're walking. We didn't even ask about it. We're just walking down to the stall. And then we're almost at our car. And the woman goes, up, Mr. Markey, were you the guy who wanted a van? One just came back in. We can have it ready for you in 10 minutes. <laughs> so we go home. And we're running in the house. And we're praising the Lord. And Barbara says, what's wrong with you men? And she says, we said, we got the van. She said, of course we got it. We prayed. So fast forward 10 years, Leanna and I come back to Ghana to visit. And we decide to make a surprise visit for the Murkies. We knew where they lived. 
We went to their house. They were so happy to see us. And I told her, I said, your faith has been such a blessing in my life and has encouraged me so much. And her husband said, well, that's good because now her faith is at zero. He had lost his business. She had received $40,000 in bad checks at her business. Their lovely daughter had fallen in love with a Muslim man, taken a Muslim name, converted to Islam, and agreed to raise the children in Islam. And she was devastated. The woman of faith. Why does this happen? I'll tell you why it happens. Because we live in a fallen world. This is a broken world. And none of us, no matter how great your faith, are immune from the brokenness that is in this world. And the Lord brought Leanna and I there to encourage them in their walk. And the last time we came, we had lunch with Barbara. Her husband, in the meantime, Court died of a massive heart attack. But her faith was still there, and it made her strong, and she was still serving the Lord with gladness. Well, it takes faith. What kind of faith are you going to have? You know, it doesn't matter how much money you have with faith promises. It's all about how much faith you have. According to your faith, it will be done for you. Let's embrace that promise this morning. Then one last story. I think, okay, just one last story. (laughs) Back in, it takes trust to be a part of faith promises, to be a person with beautiful feet. You've got to trust that God will bless the seeds we plant and it will bear fruit. It takes faith to trust that God will provide for us even through the hurts and heartaches of this world that God will provide. And then thirdly, it takes sacrificial love. In 2007, Leanne and I were doing ILI training uh, in Kolkata, India, formerly Calcutta. And there was one man there from the Himalaya Mountains. And he says, I know people, the mountain people need this teaching. And the Lord led us at that time to adopt Bhutan as um, a mission focus for our church. And over the next 12 years, I think six or seven times, I went to train Bhutanese church. Well, they're not all leaders. Some of them are leaders. Some of them are wannabe leaders. I mean, let's go to the Bhutan photo. So Bhutan, this is the capital of Tiempu. And uh, there's the huge golden Buddha looking over the city. And we went up to that Buddha, and we prayed over the city. And then we have our, um, our leadership team there. And then the next slide just shows the beautiful valley. This is in the Himalaya Mountains. This is the capital city. In Bhutan, less than one half of 1% is Christian. They have 74 people groups in that small, it's called the Kingdom of Bhutan. It's a Buddhist kingdom. They have 74 people groups, 71 of them are unreached. It is in that beautiful place, it is against the law to sell Bibles. It's against the law to share your faith. It is against the law to have a sign that says, there's a church here. And so we met in this building that had some interesting signs outside. Let's check it. Gourmet Food House. I thought I was going to a church. It also said a meat shop, Tiempu Valley Meat Shop. Then there was a Dolly's Beauty Parlor. And the sign that couldn't be posted outside because it's against the law was posted on the inside, New Creation Church. We gathered there with 40 believers who came because they wanted training so that they could share their faith and they could live out their faith in a place where it is against the law to share your faith. And there's our group. 
And I want to close with one story. And this is about one of the men in attendance there. Let's focus in on him. This is John. He gave himself that name when he was baptized, when he became a believer as an adult. And he took on a new name. And God had given him this calling to have beautiful feet, to go and share with others what God had done in his life. And he got a Jesus film, and he was showing it in a village. And one of the villagers was offended and called the police. So John was hauled before court, and he was thrown in prison, and his sentence was for three years. Can you imagine that? Three years for sharing about Jesus. Amnesty International, which turns out, man, that's a good organization, got involved and got his sentence reduced and he was released after seven months. What did the evangelist do as soon as he got out of prison? He did what God has called him to do. He went and started sharing Jesus at different villages. One year before this photo was taken, he was out in the hinterlands sharing the gospel with his family. And on his way home, there was a torrential downpour and the streets, the roads there are very precarious and he lost control of the car. It went off the side of the mountain. His wife was killed instantly. Miraculously, John and his 15-year-old son survived. And he still wears the heaviness of God's call upon his life. Never forget, we live in a broken world, a fallen world. None of us are exempt. And if you're here and you're experiencing some of the brokenness of this world, well, I'm going to say a prayer over you because you're in the right place. You're in a family of believers who care about what you're going through and want to help and be there for you. I said, John, what's the next step in your life? What is the Lord leading you to do now? He said, well, my father is dying. And so I've moved him into my home. And I'm caring for him. And it is my mission, my prayer, to help my father accept Jesus before he passes. You see, you can have beautiful feet if you go across the country or if you go across the room and share Jesus. John has beautiful feet. Do you have beautiful feet? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The most beautiful feet the world has ever seen had a stake driven through them because he loves us so much. Sacrificial love is what it takes to have beautiful feet. Let's bow in prayer together. Lord, you have called this congregation to be a church on mission. Oh God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would fall upon this place now. That you would, maybe in a new way, call us to our future task. Lord, what do you have for us? Is there someone in this building whom you're calling to take your good news in whatever form, service, in whatever form, across this world, maybe to the unreached. Oh God, help us to hear your voice. Lord, for all of us, you're calling us to, to have beautiful feet, to go wherever you lead. Help us to share what your grace has meant to us. And Lord, I especially pray over faith promises. I pray that you would encourage us to trust that these seeds that we are planting will yield a bountiful harvest. I pray that we would have the faith, Lord, to trust you for great things, greater than we can even foresee in our, of our own self. 
And Lord, I pray that our motive would be sacrificial love, the love that Jesus had for us. And Lord, if there's anyone in church who's hurting this morning, I pray for the Holy Spirit of healing to fill their lives with your grace and truth. Lord, touch us. Make us whole again. Send us out from this congregation to shine with your light. In the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So I think we're going to sing. Are you going to lead us in? Could ever 